Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Ease India's webinar today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for joining in from across the world. Uh, we're very happy to uh, have Malini Devdas with us today to uh, share her uh, advice and her expertise on marketing and selling uh, for editors. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion and questions in various forums on the topic, and therefore we thought this would be uh, of interest uh, to many people. Uh, and so I'm going to turn, uh, before I hand it over to Malini, uh, I just wanted to say that after the presentation, we'll have Q&A, we'll have time for Q&A, uh, and uh, you may uh, pop in your questions in the Q&A uh, box on uh, Zoom or you could note them down somewhere as we go through the session and uh, we'll invite you to uh, share your questions and have a discussion at the end, all right? So thank you again for joining in. Thank you, Malini, for accepting our invitation and over to you. Thanks, Anita. Hi, everyone. Great to have you here today. So let's get straight into it because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so I just want to start off with common problems. So let's just get straight in. Um, so let me know in the chat. Now, if you've ever been to one of my trainings before, you'll know I'm a needy presenter because it's otherwise it's just me talking to my camera. So let me know in the chat if you relate to one or more of these problems. I won't read them out loud. You can read them. Uh, but these are things I hear from editors all the time. And I didn't number them. I was going to number them so you could just Put the numbers that relate to you but there's no particular order so but anyway there's five there so uh let me know in the chat which of any of those uh is applicable to you oops 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 this is my mouse and me just trying to scroll down in the chat uh so don't be shy because like i said the whole point of this is to be interactive not for me to just talk at you and the other thing i'd say is you need to change you might need to change the settings on your chat box to change it from panelists and speakers or whatever it says to everyone okay so four yep hate the thought of it first one yep no predictability yep you have a website and you just thought that that was going to work um okay so people are relating to this that's good anyone else want to share um and the thing that's good about these live events is you you know you talk to other people everyone's in the same boat <laughs> so you don't have to feel bad if you uh, are struggling with marketing because uh, it's a common problem, that's why I'm here doing this talk and I've given many talks to editors' organisations literally on, um, you know, around the world now and we've all talked about these issues. So, yep, yeah, okay. So you can see in the chat for those of you here uh, that these are common issues. Yep, hit marketing and selling. And I'm not going to talk about mindset today. I am a coach that does business strategy as well as marketing mindset because maybe we can do that another time. Um, but that is a huge issue that if you've already decided you hate doing this, it's going to be hard to do it. And it is an essential thing that freelancers have to learn if you don't have enough clients. Um, so hopefully by the end of this session, you'll hate it a bit less and you'll be willing to give it a go. All right. So I just wanted to start off with, you know, your problems, but very quickly, if you don't know who I am, my name is Marlene. I've been an editor since 2004. So more than 20 years now, and I went freelance uh, in 2013. <clears throat> I've also been a coach, like I said, since 2018, because I was doing a lot of training. So my clients are academic, um, academic, so I do academic editing, and I'd been also doing training for about 15 years, and I could see that over the decades, obviously we live in an information-rich time now, so there's no shortage of information on how to do things, including marketing or writing a thesis or whatever it is and yet people still don't do the thing they say that they want to do and I discovered coaching as a profession and so I just really love helping people work out what's getting in their way because it's not a lack of information at this point um, so I set up a business in 2018 to coach editors you know partly with strategy and partly with mindset coaching today we're going to focus on strategy um, and at this point I've pretty much done everything like almost everything uh, in terms of marketing I sell editing services, coaching services, I have online courses, I do training, I've had a podcast, I've done webinars, I've used social media, I've used ads a little bit. Um, you know, you'll see at the end of this webinar, I've got some suggestions of things you can do and I've pretty much tried all the things. So I feel at this point I'm quite qualified to <laughs> share my knowledge with you and hope to help you take the first steps. All right, so before we get too far into it, I just want to sort of explain a few things to set up 
this talk today. So the, uh, the way I think about clients is I put them into three categories. So the first is agencies or publishers, basically people who know they need an editor. So you don't need to tell them what editing is. You don't need to explain it. You don't need to convince them. They are always looking for editors. And so I don't want to talk about them today because basically the strategy is just to contact them because they're actively looking for people and they've got books. You can do a test, whatever else it is. So that's pretty straightforward. The second type of client are writers, but they are people who also know what an editor does and they know they need one. So they are actively looking for an editor. And this is, you know, you can find these, usually these people will find you either through your website or a listing in a directory. Now I'm not going to dwell on that too much. I saw that some of you said, um, you know, you identified the problem point about having a website. The, the truth is having a website is not enough. It's pretty hard now to get found by Google, depending, you know, unless you have a super niche and maybe you live in an area where people are looking for someone local and then you might rank, but it's not a reliable strategy. It's not to say you shouldn't try and use SEO to try and get people to find you, but I just know that it's not the best way. <laughs> if you're just sitting there waiting and hoping someone finds your website, you really need to be out there promoting it. Uh, but if people are searching, um, then, you know, being on a directory can help. But again, directories directories often have hundreds of people. And unless your profile really stands out, uh, you know, you're just there with a bunch of other people. So my preferred target client are the people who actually don't really know what editing is, <laughs> but they're struggling. And I would say this is the majority of writers. So obviously as editors, we know that all pieces of writing benefit from being edited by a professional. Uh, and so there are a lot of people out there who need our help, but don't know what editing is. Maybe don't even really know what type of help they need. They just know that they're stuck. And so I tend to focus on that because that's a huge number, uh, but it does take some work, obviously, to help them come around to the idea that you know, maybe they would benefit from working with an editor. Uh, but also I, the reason I've done well with this is because so few editors do marketing. <laughs> and so I have been trying to help editors for a long time with their marketing, but there's so much resistance that it means the people who are out there doing it have a huge advantage because there's not many editors competing with us. Um, so hopefully that will change because one of the things I've been saying for many years is that, and this is before the, ad, you know, AI sort of got big, but if not enough people know what we do, we're at risk of sort of petering out and no one wanting to hire us. And I can see this threat now with artificial intelligence and because people don't understand what editing is, they think they can use Grammarly or whatever, you know, software they want to use. So I really think it's important for editors as a collective to be out there promoting the profession. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But today I'm going to focus on this third group, the writers who are out there who need our help, who don't really know that they need our help. Also, I want to talk about repeat clients and referrals. So for me, the goal is to get a get the business to a stage where I can just rely on repeat clients and then them telling other people. So because I work with academics, they all know other academics. So now I've got to the point where I get, you know, I haven't really tracked the exact number, but most of my inquiries are coming through my connections, my old clients, repeat clients, and them telling other people. But to get to this point takes a lot of work. And I just wanted to show you some numbers so you could sort of see why this takes a long time. And when you're looking at established editors who have been in the business for decades, this is why some of them can rely on this because their network is huge. So let's say you need two clients a month. Um, so if you're just re relying on repeat business, you need to have at least 24 happy clients who are writing a book every year, right? So that's not that likely um, unless you've got prolific authors. But if you're relying on referrals from those people, then you can't guarantee that all of those referrals are going to turn into a client. So let's say 50% of them convert to a client. That means you need 48 inquiries coming in to get the 24. Um, and if you're relying on other editors, because I know for some editors that they think that's a strategy that they can just get known by their peers, but it doesn't work because most editors are looking for work, <laughs> so, you know, um, and a lot of editors don't want to send work to people they don't know because they're not sure if they're going to do a good job. But if you did, again, you'd need a lot of inquiries. So I just want to put that in here because I think people underestimate how long it's going to take them to build a business that gets the, uh, just passive clients coming through referrals and even through Google searches and that sort of thing. And so all of that is to sort of set up the point that most of us need to be doing marketing. Uh, but then there's a question of discomfort. So the way I think about this is there's the discomfort of not having enough clients and there's the discomfort of doing marketing. And because I've been around for a long time in this space and I've helped a lot of editors, 
what I've realized is there are a lot of editors who actually don't need income, right? Because they've got a, someone else in the household is bringing in enough money to live on, or they have a job and they're doing editing as a side thing, uh, or for whatever reason, it doesn't matter to them. And so I've worked with a lot of editors over the years and I've thought, well, why aren't they actually doing anything when they don't have clients? And then I've realized, oh, because they don't actually care. <laughs> they don't need them, right? So, but the people I've worked with who do take action are generally the ones that are maybe on their own. So they've got to earn the money or for whatever reason, they've got to bring money in to contribute to the family. Uh, and so that's the catalyst for taking action. So it's just something for you to think about because, again, if you look around at your peers and you're seeing lots of editors who do no marketing, it might be that they have no clients and they don't mind that. So don't compare yourself to what other people are doing and think, well, they're not doing anything and they're okay. It might be they're actually not making any money in their business. It is really hard to tell how someone's business is doing unless you look at the books, their bookkeeping, you know, to see. Because on social media, it's very easy to, you know, make something appear to be real that's not. Um, and like I said, some people do zero marketing and are fully booked. Some people are fully booked but earning a pittance. Some people do a lot of marketing and are fully booked at a good rate. Some people don't do anything but have a big referral network and get paid well. Like it's impossible to tell. Um, so, you know, I always say to editors, just stay in your own lane and focus on what you're doing and don't look too widely at other people and, and try to make assumptions on how the business is going or what they're doing behind the scenes. All right, so the outcomes for today are just two things. Firstly, to accept. Now, I don't know why the bullets on this template don't have an actual bullet symbol. It's annoying me, but I couldn't fix it in time. Um, so to accept that you actually need to do marketing and selling, just make peace with it, right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is to feel a bit more confident about getting started. And the thing that's important to note is it has to work for you and the business, the type of business you want, um, your strengths and your clients. So again, there's no point just, it, it, I don't prescribe a certain way to do things because all of you are different and you'll have different ideas, but the principles are the same. So they're the things we're going to focus on. And then I will take you through some slides to help you think about how you can customize something that will work for you and that feels doable. Because again, there's no point in me telling you to do something that you're never going to do. Um, it's better for you to come up with your own ideas and think about how this is going to apply to your business. Uh, so let me know in the chat if that sounds good. And uh, I can't keep up with the chat, but I can look at it later. Um, all right. Yep. Yeah, there's a Q&A panel there for questions because otherwise it just gets lost in the chat. Um, so let me know if that sounds helpful. And if there's any questions you think of, just make a note of them. Uh, like I said before, like it's just really disconcerting doing things on webinars because you can't actually see anyone's faces and I have no idea if you think this is relevant or useful. Um, so I'm always seeking validation. So I appreciate anyone who puts any comments in the chat. <laughs> to reassure me that I'm on the right track here. All right. So I just want to make a note of a few things as well. Um, look, it's getting harder. And I'm just, you know, I've been doing this for, for 20 years. So when I started editing in 2004, I worked for a small agency. We did government editing um, because I'm in Canberra, capital. So when I started, my boss had had this agency for five years. So she started it in 1999 and she was well known by people. She did excellent work and there really wasn't much competition for us because we had ex-scientists, we were all ex-scientists, we were all trained as editors um, and the clients loved us and that was all great. And then 2007 is when I left to have uh, my first baby. And even at that time, I remember because I used to, when I came back from maternity leave, I was doing all the quoting. Suddenly there was a whole lot of freelancers on the scene and we couldn't compete on price. So it was, I noticed back then it changed. There weren't a lot of courses on editing back then. Now there's heaps. So there's a lot of people who have done editing courses. Um, so this is more people in the market. Uh, the other thing is that obviously it's a global market. So if you're in, uh, say, India, you've got an advantage because of the currency. I've got an advantage in Australia. I have clients in Europe and the US and obviously the conversion you know, rate works uh, for me there. Uh, there's also social media, which 10 years ago you could post something and it would get huge reach and ads were cheap. And a lot of people, especially in the coaching, business coaching space made a lot of money, built huge audiences back then. Now you post something, no one sees it, right? So there's that. And of course now there's artificial intelligence uh, coming along. And to add to that right now, at least in Australia, and I'm sure it's probably the same elsewhere, uh, the cost of living has significantly gone up. So the problem a lot of people are finding is that 
it's expensive to hire an editor and people don't have necessarily the money or they don't want to spend the money. And so, you know, that's not to put you off, but it's just to be realistic that if you're finding it hard and you didn't in the past, that's okay. Because I think everyone's in the same boat, not just in editing, but all businesses, like things are tight. And the other thing I just wanted to say is that selling editing is very different from selling other services. Now, coaching, the coaching industry has taken off in the last sort of five years. And there's a lot of people selling business coaching and marketing coaching. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of those people, they don't understand the profession. So I know when I've worked with people, they've said, oh, I really appreciate that you understand editing. The thing that differentiates editing from other services is the number of hours. So as a consultant, I can charge $200 an hour and people will pay me $200 for one hour. But if a project's going to take 50 hours, I don't think anyone's going to pay me $10,000 to edit that, right? So I see in you know online chats, editors comparing themselves to doctors, lawyers, plumbers, electricians, whatever else it is, hairdressers. But the difference is in most of those cases, you're only hiring someone for a short period. For editing, the problem is that it takes a long time. And if you lower your hourly rate, too much, um, you end up working for not enough money to live on. So it's a real different, it's a, it's a struggle. And one of the things I say to editors these days is to build in some other revenue streams, consulting, teaching, coaching, you know, things that will bring in a higher hourly rate that might be an easier sell, manuscript evaluation, things that are shorter and that you can charge a bit more for, just so you're not just relying on that long, big project editing uh, and it's very different from selling products too. So I know selling products is something I've done. It is something, you know, I will encourage editors to do, but you just have to know that to sell a digital product, for example, like a course takes a massive amount of marketing. So what I see from editors typically is they think, well, I hate marketing, editing. Um, so instead I'm going to create a course and sell it for a hundred dollars and make a whole lot of money, but they don't realize that you have to do about a hundred times more marketing <laughs> to sell a course because the conversion rates are like 1%. So if you've got a thousand people on your email list, you might sell 10 courses uh, and to build that email list obviously takes a long time. So, you know, again, services are usually the best way to start a business off, but uh, you know, editing is unique in the sense that it takes a long time. And so you have to work out the sweet spot of where you're earning enough money and you can find people who pay for that. All right. So let's talk about marketing and selling. So this is how I think about it. Um, obviously there's, your editors, <laughs> use dictionaries and you have, you might have your own interpretation. But the way I think about it is marketing is making sure people know you exist and what you do and how you help people. And the key thing here is it's really about building relationships. And I think in 2024, we have to go back to these foundational principles of business, which is relationships. Uh, because I think with the boom in social media, it got very easy to people to just think they could put stuff out there and build a huge following and sell courses or whatever it was and make all this money. But, you know, all of that's kind of crashing around us. And the thing that's never going to go out of fashion is just having relationships and building relationships with the right people. And again, if you're depending on who you're working with, for me, the advantage is that I work with academics, they all know other academics. So I can build a relationship with a key person at a university and they will tell other people. If you're working with independent authors, it might be harder because they don't necessarily talk to other authors, but you know, that's what you have to think about. Um, so marketing is raising awareness and getting people to contact you to make an inquiry. And we'll talk about inquiries in a sec, but then once you've made the inquiry, or you've received an inquiry, your job is to sell that and make an offer. And, and usually um, for editors, that's doing some kind of proposal or quote. So selling is inviting people to work with you and saying, here's what it's going to cost. Here's how I help you. And then they say yes or no, and you're converting those leads, the people who are interested, into clients. Now, today, I don't want to talk too much about the actual selling because, like I said, Fred, it is usually that's just done through a proposal. Um, but the one thing I want to uh, mention or highlight is that I see a lot of editors just focusing on the manuscript. Now, obviously, when we work, we're working on the manuscript, but when you're selling, you should be focusing on the person. The person is the person that's going to pay you, that's going to decide to hire you. And you'll see as we talk about marketing strategy, for me, the strategy is to connect with a person and help them see how I can help them with their problem. Yes, I can fix the manuscript and make it better, but that's not what it's about. It's about understanding why that person wants the book finished, the thesis edited, 
the you know whatever else they're doing polished if you don't understand that it's going to be hard to sell so just really thinking about marketing today and we're going to focus on the marketing it's connecting with your right um you know the relevant people the last thing I'll say quickly before we get into the the nuts and bolts is it's a numbers game so for me my goal is to get conversations uh, I mostly focus on coaching and training now and don't do much editing uh but still all jobs start with a conversation of some kind whether it's on zoom or by email and so my goal is to get a certain number of conversations happening every week every month so the more people you talk to the more inquiries you'll get the more inquiries you get the more clients you're going to get so that's really what it comes down to it's doing the marketing so that more and more people know who you are know how you help them building the relationships inviting them to contact you and then uh you know sending the proposal and hopefully converting enough of those proposals into clients. Um, and the reason we do this is because you cannot control even like I get inquiries most weeks or most, at least a few a month, I get passive inquiries coming in from referrals, from repeat clients, but I can't predict when that's going to happen. So if I'm just relying on that, it's too stressful. <laughs> so I have no idea when it's going to come. And again, for some editors, that is okay because they don't actually, the money is, a, is bonus money for them. But if you're relying on this income, you can see that it's dangerous to just be sitting by the inbox hoping that someone contacts you. So you have to be proactive about it. All right, so let's look at some marketing, like how to think about a marketing strategy. All right, so this is the way I think about it. You can read that. All right, and then key things to highlight it's getting the right people to contact you not just any old person but the right person and that what that looks like who that is will be different for each of you um, you need to build that rapport they need to know you exist preferably because you're going to be working closely with them they should like you um, and they should trust that you you can help them um, and the other thing is they need to believe that they're good enough so I think for a lot of editors they're too busy just worrying about their own qualifications and credentials, but actually a lot of writers are scared to contact us because they think their writing is not good enough to be edited. So it's really about reassuring them that whatever state their manuscript's in or, you know, whatever it is, you've seen it all before, you can help them. Um, and if you look at that and look at what's highlighted, it's got nothing to do with grammar. Right? <laughs> so for years I used to see editors posting grammar tips and stuff, and that's just not useful and especially not now like yes people might look at that as they're scrolling through if you're using social media but that's not going to convince them to contact you right because they're, they're not interested in that we'll talk about what they're interested in in a minute but this is the approach we're going to look at okay so these are some questions for you to think about so what I want you to do is as we go through these questions just make a note on a piece of paper somewhere um, what is relevant to you so who do you want to work with? So make a note of the type of person you want to work with, you know, even and, and be as specific as possible. So for me, it's academics, but generally it's senior academics who are writing short journal articles. So the editing I do these days is super short, like because um, I haven't got the time or the inclination to do long pieces. My rate's pretty high, so it sort of makes it not affordable if I'm doing something long. Um, usually I prefer the senior because they tend to have money and no time so that helps me, you know, they're more likely to want to outsource. Um, but if you can think, you know, so if I just said academics, that could really be anyone, but can you see I'm narrowing it down to a type of person? So if you want to put in a chat, you can. Um, oh, good, Shruti, it says new perspective. Good, we can talk about what that new perspective is at the end. Uh, but just make a note of who you want to work with. Because there's a lot of people here and I don't want to, um, don't really have time to go around the room, but as long as you're clear, but you can put it in the chat if you would like, um, but I won't dwell on each person's answer, otherwise we'll never get finished. But really just focusing on who, because this is who your marketing is aimed at. And I know a lot of editors don't want a niche and they just tell me I'll just edit anything. And what I would say to that is you can still edit anything. So when I first started, I was editing scientific papers. And that's all I really talked about is my outward marketing was focused on scientists, but I still got inquiries from all sorts of people for all sorts of things, right? So I didn't turn that down if I needed the work. But when you're out there promoting yourself, it's easier. You want to get known for one thing, solving one type of problem for one type of person. If you just talk about, if you don't have a niche, then you just end up talking about the mechanics of editing, which literally no one cares about except for other editors. So that's why I encourage you to be very specific and not to be scared because no matter how small a niche you pick, there's still probably potentially hundreds or thousands of people out there who need your help. So don't be scared to be specific. Um, 
Okay, great. Yep, I can see some things in the in the chat, so we'll keep going for now. Okay, so what type of material do you want to work on? So again, is this um, fiction? Is it blog posts? Is it government reports? Uh, is it a certain type of genre? So for example, in fiction, it could be romance or it could be short story in any genre, right? So, I mean, in any, you know, any type of short story. So again, just trying to be specific so that people will start to think of you as the person that does that. So for me, if I'm just going to go through my example, as we go through um, senior academics who are writing journal articles, short journal articles. Okay. So that's the type of thing. Um, so now we're already, yeah, so you can, um, I don't know what raise a point now means, but if there's any questions, we'll just do them at the end, Mary, because otherwise we I think we're we'll run out of time. Um, all right, so again, share that. And so, Vankadesh, I can see that you've got a whole lot of different things there. And that's, again, I'm not saying not to do that, but I find it easier if you're doing marketing to really focus on one thing because each of those things, like the editing's the same, right, pretty much, especially if you're doing copy editing or line editing. doesn't really matter if it's a book or a research paper, but... When I, in my marketing is very focused on journal articles and we'll talk about this more in a sec, but it just means your content can really focus on one type of thing and you can become an expert. So I don't do book editing, um, so I don't want to do it and I don't really promote it. But if clients have questions about book publishing or whatever, I don't know, like I don't feel like I know enough about that, but I know a lot about journal articles. So it's not to say that you shouldn't do them all, but um, just think about when you talk about your work, the more specific you can be, the easier it's going to be. Because again, books, research, papers, reports, that's millions of potential clients. <laughs> There's just so much there. So don't be scared to, to home in on the one that you like the most, um, the type of work you really want to do. Okay. So let's think about the problem that you solve. I've just realized that I have got a whole bunch of slides after this that just has each of these dot points on one slide. So we can skip through that uh, at the end. Um, now the problem that you solve is not fixing the problems in the document, right? The problem you solve is the problem for the person. So when I started freelancing, I used to talk about editing, academic editing, and no one was interested, right? And what I realized is because in Australia, the only academics, this is 10 years ago, the only academics who wanted editing were PhD students from overseas who had problems with grammar generally. Um, and so academics in Australia just thought, you know, only thought of me if they had a student who needed help. It didn't occur to them that they could get editing. And I realised that they just wasn't, they wouldn't pay any attention to what I was talking about. But then I realised that a lot of them are not finishing their articles. They sort of get 90% done and then they move on to the next thing. So since then, I've always talked about unfinished manuscripts. And that really resonates with my clients because literally some of them have seven or eight unfinished papers from the last five, 10 years just sitting there. Right? And because I sell editing and coaching, I don't dwell on how I will help specifically. I just say, hey, you've got a bunch of unfinished papers. Let's have a chat. And then I can work out what service they might need. So they can understand that, you know, that's the thing that's keeping them up at night is, oh, my gosh, I've got all these papers unfinished. They're not thinking, oh, I need a copy editor. Right? It's not on their radar. They're just thinking about the problem. So if you're working with, say, independent authors who want to um, self-publish their first novel, uh, they're probably worried about, oh, everyone's going to think this is terrible or um, I don't know how to publish something or I don't know what the next steps are. You have to really get into their head and think about what's the thing that they're worried about. Um, so um, I'm not sure when it says, Mary, uh, yeah, okay, I don't know if you're talking to people. Um, yeah, let's just do the questions at the end. Yep, so we can keep going. All right, so think about the problem that you solve. If you can't answer all these questions now, I'll send the slides and you can do this exercise later. But again, this is where I think most editors are missing the mark because all they're talking about is their services. And if you've tried talking about your services, you realise probably most people, just not enough people understand what editing is. So if you're selling other services that people know, like hairdressing, people know what a hairdresser is and they know they can't cut their own hair, that's fine. But for editors, we can't talk about editing because literally people have this mis misinformed idea about it being commas and then they think they can use Grammarly. Um, so think about the person's problem. And if you don't know this, you need to start talking to your ideal client and you can just do market research calls and talk to them and understand and hear how they talk about the problems um, that they have. All right. 
So what is the solution to your problem? So that's your offer. So again, some of you might do book coaching. So someone, if you you might help people at the start, like they're halfway through their manuscript, their first, they want to self-publish their first novel, halfway through, can't quite get it finished. Maybe that's the problem you solve is you just help them get the first draft done. Someone else might help them, um, you know, it's pretty much ready to hit submit, but you're worried about the last remaining errors and you will proofread that for them. Someone else might, um, in Australia, might copy edit PhD theses and there's strict rules around what's allowed and not allowed. So again, that's a problem you're solving and that's an offer. I will copy edit your thesis per the <clears throat> iPad guidelines. <clears throat> Someone else might, um, you might edit, I don't know, I'm just making this up, recipes for a blogger, right? So the problem you solve, the problem for them is probably that they're nervous that there's mistakes in there or they feel scared that they can't write well. Um, so that's the problem you solve is you, I'll give you the confidence. And that's what I say to editors. Actually, it's not about editing the document. That's fine. I think editors sell confidence to their authors. So confidence to send it, send the manuscript to the next, to the next step. So the next step might be self-publishing, sending your journal article off to peer review, um, publishing your blog, sending your report to shareholders, whatever it is, authors are nervous about it. And if they've worked with an editor, they can feel reassured. Someone has looked at it and given them feedback and helped them make it better. So I really think that's the game that we're in. It's not about um, editorial style. Uh, it's selling what we sell confidence. And that's how I talk about, if you see my posts, you know, you'll see, I talk about um, unfinished manuscripts, confidence, and also the stigma around getting help. So we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, so what objections are they going to have? So for me, my clients, the biggest hurdle for them is that they feel ashamed that they need to get help. So in Australia, in universities, there's a general feeling that you shouldn't need help with your writing, right? Uh, I don't know why. That's why I spend a lot of my time on my marketing saying to them, hey, look at these professional writers, full-time best-selling authors. They have a team, you know, beta readers and developmental editors and copy editors, so it's okay for you to get help. And I get a lot of inquiries from people who are absolutely mortified that they're not publishing. Uh, and it's taken them months or years to contact me <laughs> because they've just thought, oh, I should be able to work it out myself. You know, so for me, that's the biggest objection. For other people, it might be cost. You know, they might be worried you're going to change how they sound. Again, you have to know your market so that you can address these concerns in your marketing. Um, it's good to have an idea of what the offer costs. So again, just ballpark so that you know, because um, I think it is useful to give people an idea of the cost before you get into detailed negotiations. So I, for coaching, I put my prices on my website. For editing, I used, I think I put the price on there too when I had it up there um, because I don't want to waste people's time. So the reason you need to know that is because you need to know how many projects you need to hit your income goals. So again, you can't probably do all this now, but just think about, okay, if I need to do two pieces a month and I need to earn this much, then I'm going to need to charge this much. And it just starts to help you think about, okay, so if I need two projects a month and I convert a third of the conversations into clients, then I need to be having six inquiries a month, six conversations with potential clients a month to get the two. So does that make sense? Um, so we're really just trying to break this down now and think about some targets that are not just vaguely posting stuff online. <laughs> hoping but thinking about the people you know how do you help what's the problem that you solve um we'll talk about the actual tactics in a minute but i find that most editors are not thinking anywhere near enough about the person that they're trying to sell to and instead they're just focusing on the text there's too many posts about changes to the text like literally i don't think anyone cares <laughs> as they're scrolling through so let me know if that makes sense i think we're just going to skip through the next few slides because i think they're just um, the same thing. I just put one on each slide and then have a recap. So that's all the same. But yeah, we're talking about how many conversations. Um, and yes, I'll send the slide so you can think about this um, and print it out and think about it. But this is what you need to do before you just start trying to do marketing without any clear sort of aim. All right. So it's still the same questions, but that's the same questions. Yeah. All right. So let's look at tactics before we run out of time. So here's a whole bunch of marketing tactics you can try. Um, to build awareness now. Okay, so like give a talk like this, right? Give a talk to your ideal clients. So for me, I used to go to universities and I do paid workshops, but back in the day at the beginning, I would just go and give a free talk. This was, you know, 15 years ago, so there was no technology to do it online, but I went to local universities and just offered to give them a talk explaining the editing process, whatever it was, right? 
for me, my business has really taken a nosedive since COVID because um, before COVID, I would fly to universities and they'd pay me to give workshops and I'd get lots of one-on-one -on -one clients from that. I still get inquiries from five or six years ago from events I did then, but Australian universities changed their business model a while back to just getting all their money from foreign students. Obviously, no foreign students came, so they've all got no money. Um, so I've had to pivot my marketing as well. But giving a talk does build genuine connection. It positions you as an expert. It gets people thinking about understanding what editing is. Um, you can publish blog posts. Now, if you're going to do that, you have to share them. You cannot just put blog posts on your website and expect, just like we said with the website, no one's going to see it. So if you write a blog post, you should be spending four to five times the amount of time you spent writing it, sharing it, and sharing it regularly, like every year, we share the same old blog posts. Um, because you want new people to see it. The blog post should also encourage people to contact you, to you know, so you're encouraging them to actually make contact. And if you're going to do blog posts, just make sure they are aimed at your ideal client, not at other editors. So, I mean, I mean, you can have a blog for other editors, but that's not a marketing tool, right? So a lot of editors have blogs that are reflections on their business, which is fine, but your clients don't care about that. So don't use that for marketing. If you want to do a blog for marketing, talk to your ideal clients. You can do email marketing. So I'm sure most of you have subscribed to lots of email marketing. Um, it is a lot of effort and I've actually paired mine back because I just feel like my clients, academics, they're just drowning in email, you know, and they've said to me, not about, they love my emails, but I know they get a lot of email. <laughs> so I'm taking a rest for that for the rest of the year and then we'll reevaluate next year. But for me, email subscribe, uh, email, my email list did get me a lot of work. Um, in years gone by. Social media, you can pick. Uh, now, again, reach is pretty hard. So Facebook is hopeless, really. No one will see any of your posts. Instagram. Um, the thing to remember for editors is you don't need a massive audience. So if you just need two clients a month, you don't need millions of people following you. I've got a very small following on Instagram. I'm going to go back to it uh, at the end of this year because it's a nice um, vibe for me because I mostly do coaching. Most of my clients are women. They're just scrolling social media all the time, right? So I feel like that suits my work better than LinkedIn. But the advantage of LinkedIn is that uh, you actually get some longevity of the posts and people actually see it. So I am posting there, but, um, you know, you just have to play around and see what makes sense for you and for your clients. You can use ads um, wherever you think people might see them. You can write articles that people will read in whatever the publication that's relevant. Uh, Google ads are a different beast um, and social media ads. So different types of ads, you know, can work for different audiences. It depends. And I have used social media ads. They can work. They're expensive now compared to what they used to be. They can work, but you have to have, it's quite sophisticated because people don't hire an editor based on an ad. <laughs> no one's scrolling Facebook and sees an ad for an editor unless they're looking, you know, and then goes to hire them. So ads work for a certain type of service or product, but, you know, it's a, a bit of a, that's a way to get attention, but then you have to nurture those people to get them to contact you to get a quote. So it's a bit more convoluted for service businesses. Um, you can create an online community. I used to have a free Facebook group. Some of you might have been in there years ago. Um, again, it's pretty hard now. A lot of people are giving up on their groups because Facebook just doesn't show them. And I think people are following so many things in so many groups that they don't see the posts. Um, and also it takes a lot of energy to hold space for a community and if it's unpaid and you've got limited time then you've got to think about is it worth it but there's lots of ways you can do that and if you've got the time and you like doing that you know you can create an online community uh, for your ideal client so for four years I've had a paid writing community which I started in COVID I've just closed it um, but it was a great group um, and we would come together most days to write um, and it was a great way to uh, nurture the relationships, be helpful. A lot of those people went on to hire me for coaching or editing. So, you know, just get creative with it and but do something that works for you, but that is sustainable because it's really easy and I've made all the mistakes to get excited at the beginning and create something and you want to help everyone for free because that's what we want to do. And then after you, you just feel like it's a burden, right? And it's not actually helping you get clients. So just be mindful of that before you start something. Podcast, I had a podcast Again, it's a lot of work, easy to get started. <laughs> to maintain it is another thing. Uh, but, you know, it's a really great way to build a relationship because if people like hearing from you and they're listening to you every week or every, whenever it is, um, they feel that they know you and they trust you. Um, now, I think one of the best strategies in 2024 is to leverage other people's audiences. So I am doing this now 
uh, with universities. So I have formed relationships with key, like the graduate school convener at a certain university. So I know if I send her something, she will send it out to all the PhD students, right? So that's tapping into that. If you know someone that hosts a writer's group and they're your ideal clients, you could offer to do a free presentation for that group. You know, it's just like I'm doing here, you know, you can offer to do a presentation and just people get to know you. And then at the end you can say, hey, if you're interested in working with me, this is how to go about it. Um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, yeah, just old school flyers, <laughs> like sticking them up. If you, if you want local clients, put them up at a university, wherever it is, libraries. Um, and then my least favorite that I never do, but it's an option, is cold calling or emailing. Now that would work for publishers. Um, I don't think it's that effective for individual people because we just get so much rubbish email these days. <laughs> but I don't advocate that, but you know, it's an option for you. So, um, and so all of those things have a think. And again, we're just rushing through it now, but I just want you to think about how you are going to get discovered because what alarms me is how many people are finishing editing courses and they're great. They've got great skills and they have not given any thought to how they're going to find a client. Like literally they have no idea. <laughs> and they, unfortunately they spend a lot of time building a website, which does nothing or they waste time worrying about a logo and no one, like literally no one cares about your logo. They just need to know you exist and they need to know, and you need to be able to make a connection with them so that they can trust you and they know, Oh, you're the person that helps these people do this. Uh, the reason for having a niche also is that it makes it easy for other people to talk about you. So if I know that this person here helps first time romance writers get self-published, that's an easy thing for me to explain to someone else. If I hear of someone writing their first romance book, I'll think of this person and say, oh, this that person will help helps people just like you. If you just say I'm an editor, most people's minds go to magazine editing or, you know, they don't really know what that is. So Again, you just want people to know who you are, for you, them to tell other people about you um, and to build a reputation as someone who's knowledgeable, trustworthy, um, and that they feel confident to get in touch and get a quote. So think about what you like doing and don't like doing. Think about what you're willing to learn how to do. Um, and really just think about how are people going to find you out you exist. Like it's It's your job. And I see a lot of editors complaining about how they've got no clients but that's on the business owner. <laughs> it's not anyone else's job to get clients for you. And that's the reality. So, you know, I know that sounds harsh, but if you want to run a business, marketing is a huge part of that. Now, if you work for an agency, and again, I hear editors complaining about what agencies will pay them, but the agency is doing all of this. Now, I'm not saying that they pay great rates, but the reason, usually the reason they pay lousy rates is because there's a lot of people that want to work for them. Um, but the reason people want to work for them is they don't have to do all of this. So if you're just able to get work being sent to you and you just like doing the editing, then that's fine. Um, but if you want to work with individual authors or you want to have better pay, then you have to do this work. And it's it's another reason why you have to do the maths in terms of how many billable hours you can actually do. Like for me, it's not that many hours a day. I just, I get really tired. That's why I'm sort of phasing out my editing services. Um, so if you can only do a few billable hours a day, you've got to spend the rest of that time doing marketing your rate has to cover all that non-billable time. How we sort of nurture connections, that's why I like email marketing. So I used to use social media to get known and then maintain the relationship through email. Um, that's the traditional sort of way to do it. Um, but maybe you write an article for some local organisation every month or something. You know, just ways because people, unless they're looking for an editor, they're not going to re remember you. So you might think, oh, yeah, I saw that person post something you know, somewhere on LinkedIn six months ago, but they don't remember you. So you've got to be front of mind. Um, so how are you going to do that? And then how will you invite people to work with you? So that's the other thing I see, especially on social media, is no one wants to do promotional posts. Now, promotional posts don't get much reach because no one likes them. But, you know, usually if you do enough people, like they do work, when I put stuff out there, people will contact me and say, oh, yeah, I saw your post. Um, don't be scared to say, hey, I'm looking for clients. Um, don't be scared to encourage people to contact you because in the end you're helping them. And, yes, you're charging a fee, but you're helping them solve a problem. And that's the last thing um, in the next slide I'm going to talk about. But in terms of what you talk about on social media, it's not about editing. Right? We've already talked about that earlier. You want to attract attention to say, hey, I understand. You're an academic. You haven't published anything for three years. 
I get it. It's okay. There's lots of people in that boat. Okay. I've helped lots of people just like you, right? You're getting the attention of those people. And I know because people say to me, oh, it's like you're reading my mind. It's like, oh, okay. I'm, am I the only person in the world that hasn't published anything for five years? No, there's other people. Um, I've been doing this work for a long time. I've got this long list of clients um, just like you. And this is where testimonials on your website show the person just like them was struggling, hadn't published anything, worked with me, got three papers out, whatever the story is. Um, use, and again, that's where social media, if you can get it to work and get enough leverage there. Um, but however you do it, giving talks, doing podcasts, being guests on things, um, you just want them to feel that they know you. So they know you, they trust you. And it's not about how many qualifications you have, right? It's just this human thing. I think that's the thing that's missing is we've lost this ability to just connect with other humans. And that's how people make buying decisions. Okay. So they want to feel like I have people who come to me because they did my workshop and I'll just say to them, I can't do it. Here's a great editor. This editor's better than me. <laughs> Work with them. But they feel connected to me because they came to my workshop, you know, so they've got a very strong attachment to working with me, even though they wouldn't have a clue whether I'm a good editor or not, but they trust me. So it's about getting known. Um, so the cost is obviously a huge issue for people, but they've got to understand the the um, the cost of not publishing. So they've spent five years trying to write this novel, and if they don't work with somebody, it's never going to get published. So what's that's the cost to them. So how much is that worth to them? For some people, they don't want to pay to solve that problem, but for other people they might be willing to pay because they really want to finish their book or whatever else it is. For me, I have to normalise the use of experts because, again, that's a huge objection for my clients is they feel like they're cheating, they feel ashamed to contact an editor, so that's what I talk about. Um, and then, like I said, invite them to work with you. So a couple of final thoughts because I know we're running out of time is people say they don't have the time, so if you say you don't have the time, then that tells me you're fully booked and that's great. <laughs> so if you want to do 20 billable hours a month, uh, and you've got zero clients, then you should be doing 20, I mean, sorry, 20 billable hours a week, uh, and you've got no clients, then you should be doing 20 hours a week of marketing, right? Until you fill those hours with clients. So if you don't have time, that's telling me you're working. And so you don't have to worry so much, but if you've got spare time, then you've got time to do marketing. Um, people like to say, like, I know a lot of editors identify as introverts or they you know, don't like socializing. I find that actually a lot of introverts love social media and I hate, I hated social media marketing. I would rather stand up in a room full of people than post on social media, but I've just had to get over it <laughs> because I had to get clients. Right. So it is just one of those things. I've helped a lot of editors get started with social media marketing and they all tell me that, you know, they'll spend weeks or months avoiding the first post. And then after that, it's not that bad. Nothing bad happened. <laughs> Probably no one's even seeing it, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, so you just have to work out how you're going to get known. Um, and you don't know what to talk about. So the previous slide had some examples of what you can say. And then this is the thing I want to finish with. So the thing is, a lot of us have been conditioned to think that being helpful means we do things for free. So I can only be helpful if I'm doing stuff for free. If I'm charging money, then somehow that's not helpful. But I want to put it to you that the best way you can help an author is to actually edit their manuscript. Like you can't help them in your best way by sharing free grammar tips on LinkedIn. That's not helping them. The best way you can help them is to get their manuscript and edit it. And so, yes, that costs money. And that's an exchange of energy. You're doing the work, they're giving you the money. That's fair. So you have to know and be confident that your services are the best way you can help someone. You have to really understand your client's problems on the person, like not the book, but the client's problems. Why do they want to finish this memoir? Why do they want their thesis? Like, why do they need to get this PhD and make sure they pass? Um, you know, why is it important for their blog to look professional. Whatever it is, you know your client and you have to understand their problems that are keeping them up at night. Um, and you need to know that you can help people today. Like, sure, you'll be a better edit editor in five years. All of us will hopefully improve our skills. But if you keep waiting till you get better, you'll be waiting forever. So just know that even as a beginner, you can just be honest. When I started coaching, I just said, look, I just started. I've got introductory rates. Looking for my early clients. Are you willing to take a chance? And people are. So, um, I think that these are the things that, you know, we didn't talk about mindset because we didn't have time, but the confidence, you have to be confident to put yourself out there. Otherwise no one's going to know you exist. And then you can't really complain if you've got no clients because <laughs> you haven't done the work uh, to get that. So I think that's pretty much it. And I'll just stop sharing so I can see people. I know that was very fast, but I wanted to cover those things because I think 
the key thing is to really think about the person you're trying to sell to and forming that connection. And again, if you hate the thought of talking to a person, then, you know, get work from an agency or someone else who will just send you the editing. Um, but, you know, in the end, selling services is selling. It's, it's about relationships and connecting with people. And I think that's where we sort of lost our way a bit. So, um, yes. So AI, yeah, it's a problem. Um, for me, uh, in my coaching practice for editor, for academics, I talk about like really basic making time, sitting and thinking, <laughs> radical concepts, spending time thinking, reading. And all my academic clients, they're so isolated. So when I did my PhD, it was the 90s. Um, you know, there was no belly in the internet. We went into the office every day and talked to people and now no one's going into the office, at least in Australia, everyone's working from home. They're so isolated. So I'm trying to encourage them to talk to people, read, think, make time and create an enjoyable writing practice. And there are other people who talk about using AI to summarize all the literature and write your paper. And that's just the polar opposite. But my clients aren't interested in that. So I'm just trying to stake a claim in this patch here that says, if you want to do things the with thinking <laughs> you want to think uh and enjoy writing listen you know come and hang out with me but if you're interested in ai fine do whatever you want you know i can't compete with that um so questions in the q a box i can i see those yeah uh do you have tips for cold emails nope i hate them <laughs> i hate getting them uh so look if you're if you want to um contact publishers or people like that, that's fine um, because they are looking for editors. But I don't really, I mean, at this point in time, my inbox every morning when I wake up is just full of spam and people trying to sell me SEO services or whatever, some marketing, something, I just delete them all. So I really just don't think it's effective. Um, that's my answer. Um, how long can you persist on a prospect? Um, so when you say a prospect, do you mean someone that, and Venkatesh, you can unmute if you want to, so I don't persist on anything. So basically my approach is um, I put content out there. I invite people to contact me. They'll send me an email saying I'm interested. I'll make sure that they've seen my rates and everything and they know what the cost is because that's a that can be a sticking point. And if they want to have a conversation, we'll have a conversation. Um, but I try pretty hard to make sure they're pretty keen before we have a chat. But then if I don't hear back from them, I might follow up a couple of times and then I just leave it because... Um, they could be busy, maybe they change their mind. Sometimes they come back to me a year later and say, oh, yeah, I'm ready now. <laughs> so I don't want to sp spend too much time. It's up to them to be interested. It's not my job to convince anyone they need help. I'm just trying to find the people who need the help now. How do you figure out your niche? Is it the genre? So, yes, so for the course. So I do think, I mean, I prefer to have a business that I enjoy. So I sort of fall in into academic editing coaching because my background was in academia. Um I, I, I talk to a lot of editors who start doing academic editing or business editing or whatever it was because that was what their job was, but they really have this burning desire to be a romance, to edit romance or sci-fi or whatever it is, um, but they're terrified. and But that's all they read. Like that is literally they live and breathe this genre and when they have the courage to finally put themselves out there, the marketing is fun for them because they read those books all the time. They've got lots to say about it. Um, yes, I think it's useful to do some sort of course um, that specialises in the type of work you want to do because you want to make sure you know um, the things that are relevant to that genre. But just be mindful of doing it. Um, it's not really about proving your knowledge. It's just about you having confidence to do the job. I, don't, I think most of my clients couldn't really care what my qualifications are. Right? They've either heard about me, they've seen my content, they just trust I've been doing it for a long time that I know what I'm doing. Um, so if you need the qualification for you to get the skills or to get the confidence, then do it. But um, don't do it thinking it's going to convince a client because I don't think it will. Um, yes, so I Melina, do coaching. Ven Ven yep. Venkatesh would like to um, ask his question live. So go, go ahead, Venkatesh. Oh, yep, yep. Go ahead. Oh, I can't hear you though. I don't know if that's. Um, I have been answering his questions um, there, so I don't know if. He's, I think he left. Are you able to unmute your mic and uh, ask your question? His hand is raised, but we're not able to hear him, right? Yeah. 
I'll just come through. I'll just come through those questions. Any courses that can help me learn about level three editing? So I don't know about any courses. So I'll let someone. Maybe Tanu, someone can answer that in the chat for you because. Um, I don't know what level three editing is. I think different countries have different terminology. Um, I get clients through LinkedIn referrals, getting clients is not very common. How they he has been. Oh, yes. Hi, Venkatesh. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. Um, I tried to answer some of your questions already. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, this question, the third question is related to coaching. Yeah. Do you do, you do that or do you have yes. any for that? Yes. So because I started as a, because I've got a life coaching certification and I've been teaching writing strategy for 15 years, uh, I now offer a hybrid of consult, of mentoring slash consulting slash coaching. So basically, but I don't want to confuse my clients about the terminology because they honestly don't know what coaching is. Just like people don't know what editing is. Nobody understands what coaching is, right? So coaches have this problem too, that if you talk about coaching, the only people who are interested are the coaches. So the way I get around this is I say, I'll help you finish those unfinished manuscripts. When we get on the call, we talk, I, I ascertain whether it's a mindset issue, like a confidence issue, or they just haven't got any decent writing strategy, or do they need accountability? And then I'll just tailor my advice or approach to whatever they need. So some people just need a strategy, like they've not literally, they don't think about the story, they just start describing their data and they have nothing, they're not making any assertions in their writing. Um some people, you know, I, I don't tend to do too much with the mechanics of copy editing and line editing. For me, it's mostly just trying to get people to finish the draft and submit it, have the confidence to submit it. So, um, you know, I, again, people will pay for that. Rightly or wrongly, people will pay for coaching, mentoring, advice, um, teaching. And again, it's just for a few hours versus 20 or 30 hours. So, yes, I've... Um, uh, that's that's my approach. Um, but I'll just keep going through the other questions so I get through those. Um, first blog post, uh, again, it just depends, Shruti, on who it's for. Like maybe you can unmute and you can, we can talk about it. But um, I, I wouldn't overthink it. doesn't matter. No one's going to see it. <laughs> the reality is I can create a website tomorrow. Literally no one's going to see it, right? So that gives me confidence to just put something out there. I would write four or five actually and have before you start promoting them have a few out there, but you've just got to think about who is this for, what's, what problems do they have? So a good way to do this is if you're in, so let's say you're in author Facebook groups and you see, or on threads, for example, uh, people asking the same question over and over again, right? So you're seeing that all of your clients have trouble with something, whatever it is, write a blog post on that. And then next time someone's asking for help on it, you can send them the blog post depending on the rules of the group. But the market research will dictate you know, just don't. So the thing you have to do is not write it for editors. The biggest mistake editors, I see uh, editors say, asking other editors to look at their website and give them feedback. Like who cares what other editors think? <laughs> you have to care about what your potential client thinks true to you. So, um, and you have to really know. So interestingly, I, like my blog has been neglected and I, it is something I want to get back to by next year, hopefully, um, because I wrote all those articles ages ago. But the one that gets the biggest amount of hits is them like how to write shorter sentences or something, something that's got nothing to do with what I offer now, <laughs> the thing that people find, uh, but I don't promote it anywhere. Um, but blogging in 2024, it's really about um, solving a problem for someone. And then at the end of the blog post, inviting them to contact you if, they're, if they need editing. Um, so I don't, okay, so the question is, how do you find clients to reach out to? I don't reach out to clients. So I do... Um, I don't know, there's different types of ways to call this marketing, but I just put content out to attract the right type of clients to contact me, if that makes sense. So I don't email cold email or email anyone except for my former clients. So if I'm looking to say November's looking bare, I'll write to my former editing or coaching clients and say, hey, got some gaps coming up. Do you have any work? Um, if you don't, if you know anyone who might need an editor or a coach or whatever, let them know. So I will do outreach to people I know but I don't do any sort of outreach to people I don't know. I, I just do content marketing, which is I get myself out in front of people so that they contact me. Um, negotiating rates. Yep. It's hard. <laughs> so my rates are at the top. Like I charge around a hundred dollars. So I'm in Australia. All my clients are pretty much in Australia for the most part. And my rates are around a hundred dollars an hour. I don't disclose the rate. I just do a project price. Um, my take is that it shouldn't matter to the client how many hours 
I'm spending on it. I'm just promising an edited manuscript due back on this date. And most of them are employees and they have no understanding of what freelancers have to charge. You know, it's not the same as earning a salary. Um, but, yeah, it's it's hard because I know lots of editors charge half or less than that of what I charge, and I don't care at this point. But, um, yeah, it's tough now because there's so many people offering really low rates. There's a lot of editors, people who don't know what they're doing, who call themselves editors. Um, that doesn't help. <laughs> so offshore, I don't know. Like you would have to just, Nilu, probably just think again, it just depends on who your clients are. It's really hard to give general advice without knowing the details, but just think about the type of people, where they might be spending time. I guess you'd have to do it online if they're overseas, um, how you can connect with them. Uh, okay. Let's see if there's any other questions here. I thought there was another one. Um, Melina, getting you clients, just... oh, sorry, can I just do, I'll just look yeah. at one more question here. Getting clients has not been a problem, but how they pay me has been one. I want to start my own editing. Should I start from home by building a website? Um, okay. I don't know, Tanu, how things work in India. In Australia, um, you know, you have to register a business, just send invoices and, you know, have a business number. Um, so there might be some things that way that you might need to do. Um, existing clients. So when you say go on with existing clients, I'm not sure um, what that means. So I wonder if you're just getting, they're just paying you, but not through a business. I'm assuming that's what you mean. So it really just depends. And I can't really advise because I don't know anything about the legal ramifications of that. Um, but how they pay, yeah. I mean, in Australia, if you're earning money, you should be declaring it to the tax office. So I just created a business. It doesn't take very long. You just fill out a form. They give you a business number and then I can just send the invoice um, that tax invoice with the business number on it um so i recommend doing that the official way um negotiating with clients yeah so the thing is i don't negotiate because so this is the thing if you are doing no marketing and someone emails you and says can you edit something for me and you've got no prospects on the horizon you're sort of at the mercy of their crummy budget <laughs> because you've got nothing else coming so my goal is to have enough inquiries always coming in that I can just say, this is the price, take it or leave it. You know, my goal is to find clients who are ha like, I'm happy with my rates. My goal is to find people who are happy with my rates. So they think they're getting a good deal. I think I'm getting a good deal. And if, if it's out of their budget, no, it's no big deal. It's like, okay, here's the iPad list. There's lots of cheaper editors there. That's fine. Like I can't negotiate. Um, but to get into that position, you have to be marketing a lot right, to get lots of inquiries. So I know if someone says they can't afford it, that's fine because someone else will come in, you know, in the meantime. So in the beginning it's hard because you might not have any other work and then you have to take the low rate. Uh, but generally I find that's why it's just good to be upfront with the rates. And, you know, in the beginning you might just have to take lower rates just to get some money coming in. But, yeah, it's a huge problem. So there's not much, uh, yeah, that's why I don't bother negotiating. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, well. That's it, the price is the price, and you know there's other cheaper people if you can't afford that. Um, all right, anyone else have any last? Oh, so I'm not hosting the call, so I should leave it up to Anita and Mary to decide when we finish up. I can stick around a little bit, but um, I think we're just over eight minutes past the. Yes, uh, yes, I don't want to hold you it's all. Probably up, late so. for you, Malini. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. My kids <laughs> about to come. One's been babysitting, and one's been at dance class, so they're about to come home and. I have to do dinner for them. And anyway, so the night is no no any over for me. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so if there's any last questions, hopefully you found that helpful. I know it was very fast, but I really want editors to think differently about how they do their marketing and just focus on the human and um, the problem that they solve. That's the thing as marketing and marketers, that's what we're doing. It's not about um, copy editing. <laughs> it's about well, learning how so to. Thanks so much. Yeah. I think you have left us with many questions to reflect on, and uh, we're going to have to uh, schedule some time in um, within our uh, time frames to uh, reflect on them and really act on them, uh, reframe some of our thinking, and uh, probably even allocate some time to think about our business if we haven't been thinking about that so far. <laughs> so it's been a great session. Thank you so much. I'm sure uh, all of our participants have found it very valuable as many of them have indicated in the chat. Uh, thank you everybody for attending today's session and for the active participation, all of your questions. Uh, we hope this was helpful. Uh, once again, a big thank you to Malini who has uh, stayed up way, 
we're past time. Not, not yeah. that late. No, I'm a well. night owl. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, and thank yeah, you. I would encourage you to um to I would encourage you guys through your membership of ease to keep the conversation going about this because when I've done this for other organisations, that's what they've done. So they've had follow up discussions among the members and okay. accountability buddies or you know whatever it is to keep because this is the most important thing in, in a business is getting clients. So um, yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, I'm sure we'll find ways to keep the conversation going in various groups and forums. Uh, thank you very much for your time again, Malini. Thank you, Mary, for no all the help um, and coordination. Uh, any any parting thoughts, please share them in the chat box. And Mary, uh, Malini, if you had anything, any last uh, sentences to close off with, uh, welcome to share. No, I just, I just really want editors to get out there and do marketing for the sake of the profession. Because honestly, I've been saying this for 20 years, but you know, it's getting to a point now that with the threat of artificial intelligence, it's just a way for people to just think they can use Grammarly, right? And part of the problem is that we're not out there explaining what editing is. So it's kind of on us to do something about it before it's too late. And so that's why it's not just about promoting your own business. It's about waving the flag for the profession. And if we all do that, it, yeah, as a collective, if we all do that, it'll be easier to find people who value what we do but when editors don't want to do marketing this is what happens you know this the misinformation continues and then you've got people who don't know what they're doing calling themselves editors and giving us a bad name so yes fly the, fly the flag yes <laughs> go out and do that it's yes. very yes. Well, it's too late thank you thank you uh, okay. thank you everybody. Right. We look forward to seeing you again at another webinar uh, soon thank you malini and we'll continue the conversation yep thanks bye. so much for having me bye Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.